time, Will. Come on, baby. Here she comes, boy. The fishermen of Cornwall. For hundreds of years, they've worked some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. When you get a, a nice bag of fish come up, I don't think there's a better feeling in the world, you know. There's fish! fish. There's fish! It's a way of life handed down through generations. I'll be the youngest in the fleet. That's not a bad status to have, is it? Well, we start the day anyway. <laughs> Woman overboard! Oh, no! Now a sea change is coming, the biggest the industry has seen in 50 years. Fishing is the acid test of Brexit. Taking back control of our waters, a brighter future beckons. It was either vote to stay in or vote to get out, wasn't it? Just get out, like. Beautiful. What's life really like, living and working in the wild west of Britain? Can I ask for a better office? One thing a youngster these days needs is steady money coming in, and fishing doesn't guarantee that. And what does the future hold for this fishing life? Bigger the boat, bigger the balls, mate. Oh, I'm in a gambling mood today, yeah. When you're at sea, fine weather, and there's a bit of fish coming over the rail, there's no better job. There isn't a better job in the world. These men come down to their boats shortly before sunset during the pilchard season, as pilchards have to be caught at night. My great granddad was a, a pilchard fisherman, um, and back in the day they used drift nets. Every port in Cornwall had a fleet. You see pictures over there with the harbour is absolutely full. You can walk from one boat to the other and cross the harbour. As darkness falls, the men cast the pilchard nets over the starboard side. And they would basically shoot them out by hand, flake them out, and they would leave them soaked for a few hours. And then the men would pull them over the rail. The small mesh of the fishing net catches the pilchards by their gills. This boat has a catch of over 50,000 pilchards. They were pressing them into barrels and selling them to Italy. But that just seemed to die out, and several companies must have just disbanded, and the fishery seemed to die. The drift net fishery, for centuries the mainstay of the Cornish fleet, faded away in the 1960s. But now pilchards are back in demand. Today they're sold as sardines, and the hundreds of drift netters have been replaced by just 15 high-tech ring netters. Eight boats work out of Newlyn, Cornwall's biggest fishing port. Ocean fish are the biggest player in the game. They're fish processors and owners of four orange boats. I have got pay. Veteran Pete Buckland is skipper aboard the Mayflower. There's a bit poor outside. But hopefully, they're in the handy and we haven't got to go so far. It's a big year for first-time skipper James Roberts. He's stepping up from deckhand to take the helm of Ocean Fish's oldest and smallest boat, the Resolute. We've got to get a couple of boys used to the deck because both of them are sort of new to the job, and then I need to get used to the sonar and stuff like that, so I just want to get the grips of it as soon as possible, really. Competition comes from four privately owned boats, including the Lioness. Skippered by Will Trenere, it has the youngest crew in the fleet. Plan right today is we're going to steam down about an hour down the shore uh, off Port Levin. Uh, we had a bit of fish there last night. So see if we can do the same again, really. The Newlyn ring netters don't have to travel far. In midsummer, Cornwall's very own sardine run brings the fish to their doorstep. Shoals swim into Mounts Bay to spawn and keep coming until late winter. Sardines are not a quota species. Boats can land as many fish as they want. But catching them isn't easy. 
James and his crew have been thrown in at the deep end. One small mistake can mean the net's left open too long, the fish get out, or you uh, end up in the net, you could drift into the net or something like that. We are more so hunting. We're trying to track these fish down, and we're trying to catch them as they're moving. Well, there's hellish amount of lot to learn, as sonar's the biggest part. We use a sonar to locate the fish, which looks out fairly horizontally from the boat. When we find a mark, on the sonar, I'm looking for something like that. If you say this is your ball of sardines that we, that we locate, we'll then line it up on our starboard side and we'll try and shoot a ring of net around it. Stand by! Yeah, yeah. And we'll deploy the net very quickly because these fish are moving. The net will then sink. If the fish are moving faster, I have to then move faster and then I want to overtake them. Three quarters! So I essentially come round them. They're doing that, I'm doing that quicker. So the net is now falling in front of them. And I'd come right round and join the net again. We'll then draw the bottom of the net up, trapping the shoulder fish within it and the winch will wind that in as fast as I want it to wind in, because I want that net to sink beyond them until that bottom of that net is like a bowl. Once that procedure's done, they're entrapped and not getting out. Then as we haul it in, the ball gets, just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then we end up with a bag of fish at the end of it, hopefully. You're trying to encircle something that's moving, which doesn't always work. First thing I've seen, not very big. Pete Buckland has done ten sardine seasons, five as skipper. But all that experience doesn't make the sardines any easier to find. Some nights you'll go out and have a complete full, and some nights you'll have nothing, and then you could go two weeks with nothing, you know? Like, you know, you know this evening, like, it's looking normal going here now. We would have seen life by now, so I would have been in an area around there thinking, right, the birds would be diving, and a bit more life, you know, so now we would be thinking about shooting now as soon as the street lights come on, ready to go. At the moment, you're now only thinking, like, where's the next place to look? Will has sailed eight miles to the far side of Mount's Bay and is fishing off both 11. His plan seems to have worked. Yeah, you got a decent mark here now. So I'm just trying to judge whether it's moving, which way it's moving, that sort of thing at the minute. Go on! Until you've actually pursed the bottom of your net up, the fish have always got a chance to get out of your net. under the gap below your boat or under the foot rope as it's sinking. There should be a net for there. <laughs> you haven't caught them until, well, until they're on the boat, really. As soon as you finish that, I laughed the tree if I said they're in there. Well, we thought we had them on there. Um, sometimes they just baffle you, so, uh, yeah, try again anyway. Yeah. Buggers. <laughs> Close to Newlin, James has found some fish. It's, uh, yeah, not a bad-looking mark and not a bad-looking place either for us. Definitely looking like the right stuff. It's just... Uh, Trying to keep up with it at the minute. This already looks a bit different because it's uh, changing with every sweep, which is quite often what the and sardines do, moving about a bit more. With eight boats fishing in the bay, competition for fish can be fierce. Yeah, 
Yeah, we'll go south, get out of your area. Oh, I'm looking at to fly in here. And I'm already trying to learn here at the minute, so I won't get in your way. I'll get out of the way while you're shooting there. There's little tricks you can do, like call him up on the radio and say, James, I'm shooting, and you're not. Or just chuck the winky the other side, and he knows you're shooting, so he has to move. And that's pretty much barging him out of the way. Um, not physically, he moves himself out of the way. So, yeah, it's uh, bigger the boat, bigger the balls, mate. There are another boat here just shooting it. The stuff I'm looking at is going quite fast, so uh, it's annoying because I just want to shoot some fish, but it's not fair for us to get in the way of uh, one of the other boats there, sort of into them or anything. So we'll go off a little bit now and see if we can find another bit, bit by ourselves to look at. Give me a break. Oh, take a miracle to get around these. Will has found another shoal, but they're moving fast. Good size sardines, yeah. Two or three tons. Obviously, this takes the labour out of it. It's also better for the fish. Quality's better. Really, you know, the clock's ticking once they're aboard the boat. If that mark stays still, it can be plain and simple. But when they start running like this, it's, it's hard going. We got there this time. By 1 a.m., Pete's decided it's not his night. Going in. And that's why she's on the way in. A bit disappointing, yeah. Nothing's a bit of a nightmare. So there you go. Happens all the time. I think Danny had 18 bins. The crew of the Lioness will be unloading into the early hours. It's nice in the summer doing it. It's a bit cold in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> In the old days, the pilchards were preserved in salt. Today, the fish are sold fresh, so the processors need them as quickly as possible. This is taking the fish directly from the boats. We're loading it into a hopper. We're doing circa one ton an hour or 14,000 sardines. Within 24 hours, they would have been caught processed and left the country. Since its resurgence in the early 2000s, the fishery has grown into a multi-million pound industry. Now the pilchards are sold fresh and have been rebranded as Cornish sardines. Yeah, I get told off if I call a, a pilchard a sardine with my grandparents. I do get told off for that. Oh, I still call them pilchards. Uh, but uh, from a marketing point of view on the continent, you can sell sardines a lot better. Since 2010, Cornish sardines have fetched a premium price as they've carried the revered badge of the MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council, who have certified this a sustainable fishery. The MSC badge has led to a massive growth in exports. Over 80% of Cornish sardines are eaten in Europe. People want to buy into that sort of product rather than a fishery that is being uh, driven into the ground. It's a big player. We, you know, we, we really need it for this, this job. The boats in the fishery gained the MSC label by working together. The Cornish Sardine Management Association was formed in 2004. The Sardine Association was formed by the owners, the skippers and the buyers at the time. We've limited the vessels within ourselves 
capped at 15 vessels, so we don't exploit the volumes of fish that's going to be landed. Processors won't take any fish from other vessels outside of that group, which is good for us. It's rare to see um, processors and fishermen getting together and working together as opposed to against each other to, to, to keep the fishery going, to keep it as responsible as possible and keep it as productive as possible. Holding on to the MSC badge is the key for this sardine association. We need to keep that badge to sell our product. Tom sent me today more fish down there than what there was back here. There's a lot of fish. If they bunch up down there like they've been doing in here, it might be worth doing. Like. James is determined to stay clear of the bigger boats. We're going to go away a bit early today and um, go down the far eastern end of Mount's Bay, where uh, one of the other boats has been finding a bit of fish. I'm hoping if we go away early and go down there, we might have it to ourselves for a little bit, but less pressure then. We can just take our time. And... Back in the day, the Resolute was uh, a very capable boat, very capable, um, probably at a point where she was the most capable one in the fleet, and now times have come on, boats have increased, and we're the little one that tags along behind now. Skippering the boat is a step up in responsibility. No fish means no wages for James or his crew. There's not been any sign of anything yet, James. At one mar, that was straight down on the hard ground going down towards the lizard, and that's it. Well, hopefully they're coming this way with the tide, hopefully. Yeah. And I've got responsibility to other people to earn the money ultimately, but also to keep them safe as well and make sure we don't take any risks um, and put them in danger. Uh, and, and yes, at the end of the week, you want to be giving them a week's work every week to, to take home and, and give them the confidence in you as well. Yeah, a little bit of fish here is the right sort of time as well, so just trying to get the right side of them for a minute. Like they're moving a fair bit as usual. The odds are stacked against James. The Resolute has the smallest net in the fleet. With uh, such a small net, um, we just have to be that much closer to the fish than other boats do, which is very difficult. In some cases, you can get 40 metres within the mark and they start moving then because they can sense you coming. Good mark, that is, yeah. The problem is when you go through it, you're dispersing it. You know, they're moving that fast. One minute they're out here scattered, the next minute they're right in front of you, dense. Ready, Will, coming up on one now. I don't know if it'll stay where it is. If it stays where it is, we'll have a go. OK. Get on, Will. Come on, you bastards. Quick as you can, Will. We're in there. Hopefully, we've still got the bastards. OK, Phil. Come on, baby. You owe us. <laughs> I'd see him swimming already. Uh. Pretty, James. Swimming there. Boy. Pretty. Come on. Swimming here. Feeling confident, James? We got round the door, right? I was well happy with the shot. Seemed to be giving her the guns a trick. Give her the gun. Well, keep our fingers crossed. Birds are going mad. It's got a good sign, James. Got to be. There's something there anyway. Happy days, Nathan. Happy days. James has defied the odds and got his first season as skipper off to a strong start. Yeah, we're there, James. A shot, Will! He and his crew will earn over 300 quid each tonight. Their tanks are nearly full up now, so that's... Especially for our first night bit of fish, that's all we're happy with that. Well, I'd say about seven, shaky seven ton, I suppose. We'll call that it. I think we're happy with that. That's good, it's all right, night's work. We'll get too greedy on our first, first night with fish. See if that fits those nuts on the end for me. The top two, yeah? Top two. Yeah or nay? Too small. Okay.
David Pascoe is just back from a two-week cruise in the Mediterranean. He's the last skipper to join the annual hunt for sardines. The fleet's grown quite significantly and probably a little bit too large, and I'm never in any rush to start because it's a bit of a rat race now, like every other fishery, whereas five or six years ago there was only four or five of us, and it was really enjoyable, but it's gone like everything else, unfortunately. Go inboard a little bit and it should be all right. David is one of only two fishermen in Newlyn who both skipper and own their boat. The foil's going to come out, mind. As one of the ring netting pioneers, in the 18 years he's been doing it, David has witnessed the rapid growth of the fleet. Once the wealthy companies got involved, it was a bit of a race to see who could build the biggest, carry the most. What was a small developing market of one, two, three tons a night is now probably capable of one, two, three hundred tons a night. To keep up, David has had to make massive investments in his boat. Just hold on there a minute. This year, he's fitting it out with a slightly bigger net. Basically, it's a trailer full of net. There it is. With the value of a house. Sorry, stop it there, Vin. Cost 81,000 for a 260 meter net. It should be all right. Just be interesting to see the difference in the new and the old net and uh, take it from there. Six months of living by night and sleeping by day. The little transition between day and night is difficult for a few nights, but you don't look forward to it, but once you're into it, it's, uh, it's pretty much a hunt, and then you do get the you do get that hunger back pretty quickly. This looks lively enough, Will's net. See some activity of gulls, organics, or do they know where they are usually? With eight vessels now fishing in the bay, the boats can be drawn to a shoal of fish like moths to a flame. Sometimes you can have all the boats almost touching each other, which gets a bit hairy. Ourselves and those guys actually had fish that swam from a fair distance apart and dragged the two boats together. A bit crazy. Just drop it in the net, mate, please. Taking the net. David quickly takes his opportunity to try out his new net on fish that evaded wills. Something's wrong here already. What's happening back there? You have to be pulling as hard as you can, boys. If they're going to make it pay, the crew must quickly get used to the new gear. Hang on there a minute. Yo! Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Not much there, is there? Nothing. Not very many at all. Just flip it, I think. Let them swim off and we'll have them later. Some you win, some you lose. There was a hiccup with the rope that goes through the rings, you know, to close the bottom of the net. So it just brought a few rings to the surface instead of drawing the 25 of them together. So I just plotted the new net just to work out the length and to try and learn the new, new shape. There's a previous recording of one of the other nets. As you can see, it's considerably bigger than, than what we're using, unfortunately. We've all increased our net size over the years, but only by a few metres at a time. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when the fish is concentrated, you can end up with some significant catches. So I don't really, really need to say how much you can get into a 450 metre one. So Where we had an opportunity to limit the size of nets, we uh, passed it up. So. It would have been a simple way of conserving stocks and limiting catches, but nobody else is very interested. We've got to try that, I suppose, haven't we? All right, then. Let's go for it. Is it going? Yeah. So the Sardine Association was formed many years ago. Don't laugh when I tell you the reasons why. 
First rope OK. One was to obtain the optimum price for what was a premium product. Don't let this come back as far, yeah? yeah. And two was to manage the catch levels. Eighteen years later, we're fishing for less than we were when we started. Yeah, and the management of cash levels has not been very successful. But now, for the first time, the Sardine Association has to urgently manage its catch. The members have been forced to work together. Scientists have recently discovered that sardines caught in Cornwall are a separate genetic stock from sardines caught further south. They believe now there's two different stocks in the area of sea that we fish and the area of sea that the French and Spanish fish. The prized MSC label is based on the understanding that the sardines were all one stock. So whilst new studies are carried out, the MSC has asked the Sardine Association to put a cap on how much they catch. We haven't been restricted before. There's no quota involved with the sardines. There's not pressure stock. Um, so basically, you can fish away and catch whatever you wanted. We're looking to set catch limits that, um, that meet the requirements for our MSC. From a processor's point of view, obviously, they, they want to process as much fish as they can. From a catcher's point of view, they want to catch as much fish as they can. But when you're, you're trying to set limits and you're trying to share the amount of catch between all the, the processors and all the skippers, it's quite a difficult decision to make. The boat owners, skippers and processors are gathering to vote on how to restrict the catch. We're either going to have an agreement where we're all catching a certain amount of fish across the board or we're going to each have our own track records. So as long as they give me what I caught last year, I'll be happy. This season, they need to divide a total catch of around 7,000 tonnes of sardines between the 15 member boats. It should be, uh, it should be interesting, but uh, it, it's key that we get this decision in order to maintain MSC. After a couple of hours, they voted to limit the catch based on how much each boat caught in previous years. Yeah, yeah we're allowed 600 and... I've got the weights here, actually. Two seconds. 640. All right. A little bit less than the ice store and a little bit less than Bullock. Yeah, what's Stefan got? Four, 1,400. There's obviously some other boats got massive restrictions, so at the moment, I'll keep my mouth shut and just catch it. Really? By demonstrating that they can restrict their catch, the members of the Sardine Association have bought themselves some time. But if they're to avoid further restrictions in 2019, they need new research to prove that the sardine stocks are sustainable. Body Grace is my own boat. Um, I've had it about five years, and when I bought it, it was about uh, 30, 30,000 pounds. Um, and the money I, I used to buy it was from what I'd earned sardine fishing. A few years of working hard in the sardine fishery means committed fishermen like James can reap the rewards. The boat's sort of brought and paid for, but it's, I'm always trying to invest in more nets for the boat, pops and maintenance of the boat and stuff. Um, the off-season for ring there, and I can go and earn a full-time living in this then. James hasn't just bought a boat. He's also managed to buy a house. I mean, we're lucky to have a mortgage, like, especially with fishing. You go to any sort of bank or loan, get, try to get a loan and mention fishing, and they sort of start getting nervous. So we're lucky, lucky to have what we got, but, you know, it's always in the back of your head. You've got to, before everything else, you've got to keep a roof over your heads, really, especially with the children home. But as an ambitious young fisherman, like many here, James is concerned about the ongoing Brexit negotiations. That's the last job now for that. Now, the more important job is putting our flag up now. No fishing cellar, that's what that one is. So we'll get that up somewhere up the mast in a minute. Window sticker here as well. 
There's a reason why Europe was so desperate to get a good deal on fishing. Um, because they've got the big, bigger slice of the pie, really, and they got you know get a good deal out of British waters, really. British fishermen don't have a fair share at the minute. There have been dramatic clashes between French and British fishermen in the Channel over scallops. Oh! The French are said to have thrown rocks and smoke bombs at the rival boats as they accuse them of pillaging shellfish stocks. Well, they clashed off the Crazy. Uh, absolutely nuts. Yeah, it's a hose up. See the doors up? Yeah. I would say that's to stop them getting thrown stuff out there and crew, like, you know? Yeah. National rules mean their fishermen can't... Typical French, isn't it? I think they own the place. I don't fish anywhere near it. I don't fish the same fishery, and it's just the same as any other fisherman. Watching those videos just makes your blood boil because our boats are there completely legally, and they're also outside of their 12-mile limit. Yeah, we can't do nothing about it when they come on six miles off our shore catching all the haddock that we're not allowed to catch. And we are talking to the French authorities at the moment in order to make sure that there can be no repeat of the scenes that we saw. And our government tells them to, well, hang on a minute until we sort a deal out. There doesn't need to be a deal. They're, they're, they're legally, they're allowed to fish it. Our government want to grow a pair of bulls, as you might call it, you know? Stop saying yes to everybody. Look after their own, you know? It's thought that over 90% of the UK fishing industry voted for Brexit. I voted for Brexit. I was very passionate about it um, because I'm at, I'm at the start of my career and uh, the few years I've been in it, all I've really seen, especially in the inshore fishery, is um, it's more legislation, more limits. The majority of fishermen in Cornwall would have voted Brexit mainly because of the way the fisheries are managed. We're throwing thousands and thousands of pounds of dead fish over the side because Brussels tells us we have to. We have most of the ground. Uh, the French have the, the lion's share of the quota by a vast amount. So I think fishermen want our waters and our quota back. I feel that all fisheries need management, you know. It's all very well saying, oh, the quota's this, the quota's that, but at the end of the day, fishermen in their very nature are greedy. And without management, there were many fish left, so... I don't think the EU's all, t you know, you can't blame everything on them for the way the fishing industry's gone. David was one of the few fishermen who voted to remain. Concerned that the fishery could go the same way as the old pilchard industry when its European market collapsed. A high percentage of the fish is exported to the continent, so there'll be some sort of action from the other side of the water without a shadow of doubt. You know, the problem with sardines is not a very high value fish. If they impose a 10 pence a kilo levy or something like that, we'll be snookered. I think we can manage our own fisheries. I think we can manage them more sustainably and responsibly than we are now, yet still be more productive and, and financially beneficial to, to fishermen, to the fish processors, and, and to, ultimately to the country. This is where we are this year. What's it looking like? Yeah. To try and hang on to their prized MSC badge beyond this season. The members of the Sardine Association are taking matters into their own hands. Right, let's get out of here. What we need to do as, a, as an association is improve information on stocks so we can give that to uh, fishery scientists so that they can better assess how much fish is in the sea or how much fish is in our area so we know how much to catch. The Sardine Association is working with the UK fishery scientists to calculate the size of the Cornish stock. I didn't know if you actually put like a whole number in that end. Brilliant. Know. That's all we've Excellent. So what we're asking them to do is keep a track of everything they catch, um, exactly where they caught it, um, what depth they caught it at, and also to take a sample every now and again of what they're catching. For this new research to be counted, it first needs to be ratified by ICES, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. They assess uh, the science from all nations that are in the uh, particular area of fishing, and then they'll come up with a best estimate of, uh, of the stock. So uh, the MSC use ICES advice to, to decide how much we're allowed to catch. It's 
very rare for fishermen to work together. But in this fishery, we have to, um, and we do. On certain nights, we take measurements of a full bucket of sardines to help the science behind all this. So it doesn't seem like very much, but I think it does help, you know, all the boats measuring what they catch. It's in everyone's best interest to help this thing move forward. It's a race against time to collect enough data, hoping it proves that their current level of fishing is sustainable. Unless the ICs do change their advice, then for 2019 we'll have to catch, as a fleet, 20% less than we did in 2018. If we fish further than their guidelines, then we will lose our MSC accreditation, and therefore we could lose the market, so it's going to be a tricky 12 months. We've been uh, struggling a bit the last few weeks, yeah. A bit of a mixture between, I suppose, lack of experience on my part and a uh, fish not playing ball, yeah. It's been two, well, two, two, two and a half weeks of very, very little. I think we had one settling come back from Ocean Fish, which is the paperwork we get at the end of the week, which was minus six pounds. We didn't even cover the expenses one week, which was a bit frustrating, but... Right. I'm desperate for money, you know. I got, you know, got to pay the mortgage, your kids home, and all that. But you, I want to be earning money for the for the crew as well. Windy weather coming next week. Well, hopefully it'll bring a fish in a bit. Nothing else. There are fish in the bay. First time, baby. And while the other boats are catching them, James keeps missing. There's a nice bit of fish here, but it's right on the bottom at the minute. If it's on the bottom in shallow water, it's all right. We can, our net will sink enough to catch it, but we're right on the sort of borderline of where our net will fish at the minute. Nice amount of fish here. It's just not in the right place at the minute. It is a tricky place to learn because there might only be enough fish. Four or five of the vessels are out, and there's seven of us. You've got one chance before it comes dark. If you miss them, you've got a very long night ahead of you. Might just get a gear on them, and this one here is looking pretty good. The fish have moved, so James decides he'll have a go. All right, Will. by the looks of it. Uh, as far as any, probably a couple hundred kilo of fish there, so slip over that rope and they'll get back alive then. Yeah. No, no good being pissed off, is it, James? When it's a prolonged amount of time, you don't catch any fish. Um, you, you literally are earning nothing. You've got no money coming in. So it can be very frustrating um, and adds to the sort of stress, if you say, or the worry when you're running the boat that, you know, I, this is me, this is down to me. I'm, I, you can control if the fish is there or not, but you still feel a responsibility to, to find it and to, to provide for your crew. So it's very... Uh, yeah, very stressful at times when you're not catching anything at all. Autumn storms rolling in off the Atlantic keep the sardine fleet in harbour. Um. What have you got? James gets a rare evening at home with okay. wife Jess and the kids. <laughs> I sometimes wish for bad weather, just because you know that you'll have, have him home for a bit. Okay, but then okay. it's bad to wish for that because of the financial side of things. So we need, we need the money as well. So. Are you coming in? <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie, 
money down. With barely any income from James's fishing, they've had to rely on Jess. I work on the switchboard um, at our local hospital, and I start at midnight and finish at six in the morning. <laughs> so they're a bit annoying hours. So I find it more full on when James isn't here, like at this sort of time of the day. Like it's difficult when they're. The kids are tired and teasing and you're trying to cook and but that's like the life of a mum I suppose. <laughs> we kind of get a, a, a same wage from me every month really so it's it's a good yeah it's it's good to know that we get that every month without fail but it's also quite difficult when you know that sort of James's earnings aren't gonna add on to that. Since we've been in the house it's just been for a year now, just been just scraping by, really. So, um, which again, is a lot of people do, but, but it is just always a worry of where is the yeah, where is the next paycheck coming from? You miss out so much at home, then. So you try and find a happy medium, and at the minute we've been struggling to find a happy medium of plenty of time home with earning enough to pay the bills, like. Anchovy fever, once that A word is mentioned, there's been a few anchovies up Plymouth or Brixham or something like that. Everyone's on the, on the edge of their seat then. Anchovies have been spotted 60 miles east off Plymouth. They're a highly lucrative catch. It's a chance for James to turn his season around. We've been fishing all of the, these uh, bays here. Jim, we're going to leave today, steam out around Blizzard Point here, and then, uh, and then up towards uh, Plymouth and the Fourway area. Our anchovies will be nice, a bit more expensive. Top our uh, top our season up a bit, which we could do with. Um, but if there's pilchards there, we'll have pilchards. We'll be we're not really catching anything here, so so we'll be going for anything up that way. The entire Neilin fleet has caught the fever and up sticks to Plymouth. Good evening to you, yeah, just like some uh, Sutton Arbor, please. Uh, five persons on board. Yeah, thanks, well, have a good one. Thank you very much, Lot. See you this evening. Thanks, well, thank you. Like sardines, anchovies are a non-quota species, so any ringnetter can target them. Warming seas are bringing them north to our shores in greater numbers. The anchovies are something you, you cannot plan on, you cannot bank on. Uh, if they happen, though, you can't really mess around with them. You, you've got to take advantage of it. If we had a boatload of anchovies, I could afford to take a month off. I think our best year was 110 tonnes of anchovies in four weeks at £2,000 a tonne. You can do the maths. It was good. It could be anywhere, so we'll uh, go out and see if we can hunt them down. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll, uh, it'll pay off, hopefully. I don't know how much more, more nights and no fish I can take. An hour's sail south, and Pete has found some fish. I've uh, just seen one for the first mark I've seen, which is down deep ish. Stand by! Stand by On the ball we head right. Are we going? Hi, right, boys. He's in there. Right stuff, I think. Yes. The mark stayed still, so I'm hoping it's gone up. It looks like it went up in the back of the net, so I'm hoping we're in business. Keep first in. James hasn't found a thing. It looks like two boats are shot to the west of us five miles and everyone else was shot to the east of us five miles. Needle in the haystack in a minute and we're all by ourselves here in the middle. <laughs> I didn't hear anything for the boats to the west, so I thought, well, we'll come around and go back towards the other boats and about 20 minutes after coming around, we see the other ones are shot, so it's just... Couldn't make it up. Got to be the right place at the right time. It doesn't seem to happen very often with us at the minute. Looking okay. It's the right stuff anyway. I think. They're looking blue here. Yeah, they are different species. Oh, we've got about three 
three or four times, more than 75 anchovies, 25 cent pilchers, something like that. Four ton of chovy mixy. Go find some more, I suppose. There's a decent mark here. God knows what it is. A few of our pilchers, a few of our anchovies, but struggling to get thick fog on it. With this, you want a bit of a reference. I usually use a land, but lights broke on the compass. And uh, yeah, just frustrated at the minute, as usual. I'll get ready again in a minute, and I'll see if I can get right inside of this in a minute. All right, Phil. Purse, yeah, it got round the whole thing where we're still in there, I don't know, but it went very well, the shot, so... Hopefully, God knows what they are. It's looking OK. Come on! Come on, baby! Folks are looking funny, James. They're looking heavy. Come on, Come on boys, we deserve it. Show me. Oh, we got him. That's it, mate. Look at that. Yes. Oh, beauty. <laughs> Keep on singing, boys. That's absolutely ace. Well, I'm not going to be happy until they're there. Oh, they got everywhere. This is more like it. This is what we wanted. The difference about 20 minutes can make in a man's mood. <laughs> oh, I'm spin the ball on the deck. That's 40 quid on the deck there now. This is one of those you just want that bump to be endless. You just want to keep railing them. Here she comes, boy. <laughs> Look out. The boys are on it. Seven, about seven tonne there and about 1,300 pounds a tonne, so the boys should take home over 1,000 pounds each for the night, hopefully, which is very good. That's my mate, you know, I, well, I'm desperate for, for a surge of good money, but I'm chuffed at it for them now. Mummy say Dad, Daddy caught seven ton anchovies last night, Eva. <laughs> Bit happier today. Yeah, I bet. Oh, uh, very, very happy. <laughs> when I got your text, I was like, yes! yeah. Yeah, that's probably the first happy text you've had for about a month, Morgan. As it stands at the moment, I spoke to Pierre on Tuesday, and what they're saying is the next meeting there, our technical meeting regarding sardines, will be in January. And, um, While the fleet awaits the latest science on the sardine stocks, Gus has arrived in Plymouth to discuss next season. If the association wants to keep their MSC label, they'll have to comply with the current IC's advice. The advice for us in the UK is about 5,000 tonnes, yeah. so it's going to cause us a problem. This season, the fleet is capped at just over 7,000 tonnes. So let's look at this another way, Gus. So next year... Yep. We have to have this 5,000 ton yarn. If we want to maintain MSC, How yes. are we going to divvy that? Again, that's, that's a Your discussion. personal opinion. I mean, whatever track record we've all got now, it's just going to have to be a relative reduction off that. No, I don't think so, James. Why should it be, no disrespect, a certain bloke has got 1,500 tonne, he's going to take a little bit of a cut. If you take a 10% cut, so for you that would mean 50 tonnes. Yeah. On a 500 tonne quota, for somebody who's caught 1,000 tonnes, it would mean 100 tonnes yeah. cut. Exactly. Yeah, but yeah. what could that? Yeah. To get under that? Well, that's, that's, that's how you get to the 4,000 tonnes. Well, you can't see how you're going to get under it. Yeah, well, it's just going to be quite a reduction, isn't it? Yes. A hellish reduction. Yeah. Yeah. It's not viable. It's just not going to be... Crews will walk, They'll, they won't stay. And, well, these big companies, especially our company, they've got massive investment. They're not going to... It's not viable for them to operate, basically. The association faces a stark choice for 2019 reduce their catch to 5,000 tonnes, which won't be viable, or give up their MSC label and risk losing their markets. Well, at the end of the day, um, the, the boat's uh, 
need to remain profitable. You know, it's not just the skipper that, and, the, and the vessel owner that uh, takes a living from the boat. You know, uh, every crew member has got a family and we've got to make sure that, um, you know, they're, they're able to earn a living. There's one last hope. The Endeavour, the UK fisheries research vessel, has arrived in Foy with news on the current state of the Cornish stocks. Over the last three weeks, the scientists on board have been leading the survey of sardines in the seas around Cornwall. How's it going? Good to see you. Good yeah, to you see too, you. you too. If the data proves that the stocks are healthy, the association hopes to persuade ICs to update their catch advice, used by the MSC in time for next season. So this is where um, we do all our acoustic processing. Right. On this trip, we map and quantify the sardines in, the, in its population. From the survey, we, we can calculate how many fish there are. That information gets fed into the ICES, the International Council of the Exploration of the Sea, the working groups that deal with the assessments. And there it gets determined how many can be fished effectively. We started in Swansea about two and a half weeks ago. We've made uh, really good progress down the Isles of Scilly and really started to, um, to enter the, uh, the Eddystone Bay now. And these, these transacts are the same every year? Yeah, we know these capture the, the population representatively. So this is an echogram of some data we collected last night. So what you see here is the surface and this is the seabed here. And uh, all these marks here, just above the seabed, are uh, fish. And in terms of your uh, initial interpretation of, uh, of the biomass, the stock that's uh, there, is it, is it positive? Yeah, it, it, it looks pretty good. I mean, for this year, I can't quite say, because we, we tend to calculate those values right at the end of the survey, because yes. we, we stratify it and do it that way. But certainly, based on what we've caught in the catches and what we've seen in the acoustic data, there, there looks to be, uh, you know, it, it certainly looks similar to last year, if not a bit more. We've only done half of the survey. But what we do know is that last year, we calculated the biomass to be about 140,000 tonnes. And 140,000 tonnes is, is quite a lot of fish. The sardine ring netters themselves take less than 10,000 tonnes a year, so in principle that would suggest it's a very sustainable fishery. It confirms what um, our guys are seeing on the ground. You know, we've seen a lot of fish this season and in the previous couple of seasons, but the science that they're collecting it takes time for that to filter through the, uh, the IC's process. And that delay is, is obviously causing us problems in terms of our MSC certification. So it, it's very frustrating, really. Yeah, I'm optimistic that I can make a living out of the sardine fishery up to the end of my fishing days. But I'm not so optimistic that it can provide a living for all of the people that are in it. It makes you think how long we got left in this sardine um, fishery. Don't know how it's going to pan out. But it's early days, so we're not going to change jobs. We've just got to go catch them. The anchovies have disappeared, so the fleet has returned to Newlyn and their day job, chasing sardines across Mount's Bay. Yeah, it's been uh, carried on the usual uh, trend, really. It's been a bit of a struggle. I think it's almost a rite of passage having all the... Uh, frustrations and, uh, you know, muck-ups, because you've got to learn from them. And With the problems we've had, o Ocean Fish has sort of said to, them, uh, said to us now they'll invest in a new net now, so that's a big, big relief for us for next year. So this has been our learning year. Next year will be our go-for-it year next year. When I started as a skipper of a ring net, which was the Resolute, it's a tricky boat. And the net you can imagine now is, is the original one, so it's 14 years old. It's had a lot of damage done to it by us learning. James is a very smart fisherman. The next year he'll have a new net. He'll be thumbs up and up with the rest of us. Nice to be back home. It's so frustrating when the fish are there, but no matter how hard you try, they, you just can't catch them sometimes. Uh, that's when it gets really frustrating, but you just... You, you know, you can't give up on that, you just gotta... It'll come right. Do you want us to have the chain on quick? Yeah, go put it on. Oh, it's worth a go. Yep! Yeah. Oh, I love the ring end. Here we are now, at the tail end of the season. First quarter! I'm looking forward to a break. 
I'm hoping it's all right. You can see our track there, a little bit of mark in the middle, so. Well, she'll uh, go off and do a bit of lobster fishing and spider crabbing and so on in the daylight. You can still lose them, yeah, until you press up. But, yeah, give it a month or two, I'll be uh, looking forward to the next season again, yeah. Looks like something there now. Skin! <laughs> That's an early celebration. I'm being very confident, mate. Daylight still. Moon's coming up there. Oh, there's something in there. Yeah, when it goes right, you really can't beat it. The way it's been this year with a, a young and keen crew. Oh, Willie! <laughs> you know, all three of us geeing each other on. And, <laughs> yeah, it's been good crack. He's chirping like the bird. There's fish in it, but I don't know how big. I'd have to wait till we pull it up to see what uh, weight's there, but it's uh, looking good. Despite their challenges this season, many boats have had a good year. Somewhere along the line, you have a good week. I think this year our best week was in excess of 100 tonnes, which gives you a buzz. This year, uh, we ended up catching um, just over 600 tonnes. Pretty happy with that. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. All singing, all dancing, all fist pumping, crew. Well, we've, we've searched pretty much everything we can search now. And we've uh, called that it, really. For the season, we caught um, the Resolute caught 140 tons. We had this season, which um, is not not a very good season at all. I'm not going to look at it as a waste or, a, or all a negative. The fact that I've had a year now to, to hopefully learn, I'm keeping optimistic as ever for, for next season. Any fisherman that spend their life in fishing, it's not all about the money. Obviously, the money makes the world go round at the end of the day, but uh, a lot of the, the drive in fishing is. You know, you want to catch, you want to catch more. You're a fisherman. On the Fal Estuary, siblings Jason and Nikki are struggling. You do get a year where the, the oysters don't grow. Their ancient way of fishing no longer pays the bills. I couldn't go back to work in a shop. Not a chance. Oh, yeah, this fish. So they're gambling everything on a new boat. plotter has gone. Not looking good. Nice oh, push me to the limit. If you would like to find out more about the UK's fishing industry and how it's changing, the Open University has produced a free poster. Order your copy by calling 0300 303 3827 or go to bbc.co.uk forward slash fishing life and follow the links to the Open University.